This is a Wild Gate Production Podcast. Roll them bones. I know who you came here to be. Be what you want in the game of D&D. Assassin, halfling, human, or rogue. Just gotta pick up all those dice and let's roll. We're rolling now for real. We're rolling now for real. Welcome to Save or Die Expert Edition, the first and original classic D&D podcast. Good evening, folks, and welcome to adventure number 132 of the Save or Die Expert Edition podcast, Hacking and Slashing. I'm your host, DM James, and with me tonight are DM Vince. Hello, hello. TM Eric. Hey, folks. And DM Glenn. Hi, folks. You know, the good thing about doing these podcasts with Eric, he says the same thing every time. So if Eric, you know, audio goes out, I could just dub in, hello, folks, (laughs) from other shows. It's just so funny. I noticed that today. Give me about three shows I could do him. Did he just, oh, Eric's not here? Hello, folks. Uh, they, you, hiya, peep. You know they did that actually on another sh- another podcast, uh, Order sixty six podcast. When uh, back in the day when they were Jim, uh, I was Chris and Dave, and Chris wasn't able to join, so they put just put Chris's common phrases on a soundboard, and they were like, "And GM Chris, hello, folks." <laughs> just, they just kept playing the soundboard. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, so we that's hilarious. Had, they, they had it earlier. Remember the earlier side we did was what I forget what what episode it was, but. Uh, Mike said the wrong episode. He says, Glenn, just record the number and I'll dub you in it. Nobody noticed. Yeah, no one really cared. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. And, and this is adventure number 13. <laughs> we did that for, actually, we did that, I think, in one of the early episodes for you, Glenn. You weren't able to attend because of a play you were doing. Really? And people were like, where's DM, Glenn? Where's DM? So the next episode that we did with Mike and Liz, I uh, I dubbed it. It was like, and DM, Glenn. I went, oh, folks. And everyone was like, we. <laughs> And we just made it like you were there, but in the background the whole time quiet. And we're like, DM Glenn. And he was just quiet. And what do you think, Glenn? Oh, folks. (laughs) Spit my water out, dummy. (laughs) There goes damaged equipment now, Glenn. Thanks. So this whole show, all my, my whole life is going to be, hello. So like, I am crew, totally retarded. I don't know. (laughs) Now that we've uh, totally derailed the podcast. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> I like you, Jim. So this week, on, <laughs> this week on Different Strokes, Arnold. <laughs> this week on Saber Dot Expert Edition. Now, I had now Jello this... today. <laughs> what? what? We, we have no idea what we're doing, folks. So just bear with us as we get our, our, our charisma um, together. <laughs> this week. Oh, fuck. This episode, <laughs> that's at the end, Glenn. <laughs> it is, to let you folks know, it's 10 o'clock at night here, Central Time, 11 o'clock have, Eastern, so... I haven't had a drop to drink. <laughs> no one's drank anything, we're just getting punchy here, so... <laughs> All right, um, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, hacking your classic D&D experience, um... To suit your campaign, to bend it to fit other genres, and generally just customization, um, how to do it, uh, how the system, uh, whether you're using Holmes or BX or Swords and Wizardry or whatever you're using, uh, to how those systems, the simplicity of them lends itself to that, how to implement that at the table, and to whether or not you realize that you're probably already doing it. Um, you know. So that that's kind of the topic for this evening and so i'll let somebody else <laughs> launch into something about that since we're all sober and punchy oh yeah uh, when i think hack i think of taking your favorite game and suiting it to something of like i don't know i want to play an episode of terminator today that's what i think of when i think of hack or i want to play a, a game of gi joe with D basic uh rules that's what i when i think of hack i think of that are you gonna uh, do that for us because that sounds actually pretty awesome what gi joe i uh I, I kind of wish I kind of wish uh, full, D, full on gamer was on this show right? because he's like the mad scientist of hacking systems. 
you want to talk about hacks? You, you know, you know how you could use a uh, classic D and D to play GI Joe. Uh, How's that? Pete Pete Spawn, Small Niche Games. He just put out uh, Operation That's White right, Box. He did. Yes, he did. Which is totally you could totally use it to do GI Joe as long as no one dies. <laughs> <laughs> well, if no one actually can hit either each other, so that no one will die if you play by exactly. the cartoon rules. Right, well, but if, if you cross that with Cartoon Action Hour. I... Oh, that, that'd be good times right there. But but the thing is, is if if you're doing judge, if you throw so much as a as a uh, a matchstick at a plane, it will explode in a massive fiery expulsion of of living uninjured individuals. Oh, because they always jump out at the last second. That's why. Exactly. Right. Fall 500 feet and yeah. land on their feet. Did you? No, um, it, speaking of that, right. a joke on the side. Community did an episode that was all GI Joe cartoon. It was on NBC, and they actually killed someone. They killed Destro in the uh, the cartoon, and they GI Joe put them on trial, saying no one ever dies in our episodes. So. Oh, that's awesome! You yeah, have to check and, it and out. He, and he dies. They pull back one of the jokes, going, and "That's why you have to look both ways when crossing a street." And now you know. And knowing. And knowing is half, half the, the battle. battle. G.I. Joe. All right, so so let's let's take that G.I. Joe as an example, or the 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 war genre, the modern warfare genre, and, and look at it. If you wanted to run B or you wanted to run a classic D and D game, but and your players didn't want to run a new system, you would need things like firearms rules. How would you change your classes up? Um, my first thought was, you take your wizard, and instead of it being daily spells, he's got a collection of expendable gadgets. That works. I um, believe there was a Dragon magazine back in classic D&D day that actually gave you firearm rules. I can't remember what Dragon magazine it was. I recently got from someone, um, I think he was trying to get us to take us him to review it or one of the shows to review it, um, a pamphlet, a saddle stitch book that looked like one of the original, like, you know, three white books or supplements. And it was all about using... Um, basic D and D to play like uh, John Carter of Mars. And, yes. Or, it's like or Thunder. Red, red planet. Or I can't remember. Warriors yes. of the red planet. Yes. yes. And all the, sp instead of spells, they were all gadgets, but they, ju they duplicated spells. I put it in my castles and crusades game and it worked perfectly. Yep. You know, cause they were all, they were just spells redone as gadgets. And and that's that to me is is the key when it comes to hacking up a system, um, and using it outside the genre is remove the visual trappings. Look at how things work mechanically, and how something in a different genre would work similarly. You know, a thief is nothing more than a, than a spec op or an assassin. You know, you just change the name thief. Right now, now let me let me uh, mention another game that basic here but it gives a good example is when they first created Chain, how they did the powers was what is the effect we want and when they work back to the cause you can do the same thing with spells what does the spell do how other than casting the spell right exactly um other stuff you know like armor tends to be tough for people because you know you think plate mail and leather right. and you know, well, well, what's to stop plate mail from being heavy ballistic body armor? And somebody happens to get a lucky shot at one of the joints, and that's why it goes through. I, I think the tough parts come in when you have to start uh, addendoming, addendoming or adding to the rules for things like people who want their firearms to be accurate and lethal, which I tend to think is a, a, it's a slippery slope. It can get rough pretty quick. Yeah, that's the whole thing of reality versus game ability. Right. And game ability should, in my opinion, always come out on top. Yeah. When I was when I was doing White Star, which is you know basically a sci-fi hack of uh, of White Box, a lot of people asked me, well, how come your your laser guns don't do more damage, and how come you know a fifth level character can, can get shot four or five times by a laser gun and live? And I'm like, because it sucks to die, and it's pulp sci-fi. You know, Flash Gordon. Flash. You know, he, Sorry. Ah, uh, he survives <laughs> everything. You know, yeah. you know, you know. Even in more recent films, uh, the the new Star Wars movie, there's a, a scene in the very very beginning where an Imperial officer gets shot in the shoulder, and he's fine. 
You know, yeah. whereas a stormtrooper who is going to be a one hit die creature, you know, you throw a stick at him and he falls over. You know, as a matter of fact, there's a scene, several scenes of a guy with a stick beating the crap out of a bunch of stormtroopers. If that ain't a monk in a sci fi game, I don't know what is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There are so many, I've seen so many hacks out there of BX or OD and D or homes or something. It, it boggles the mind, really. Um, it uh, you it's until recently how flexible these systems are. Oh yeah, I I was from like uh, was it a uh, Reverend Dak Dak Ultimac who does a lot of uh, DCC uh, designs. He did hack firearms, which was specifically written for swords and wizardry. And I have other. that. I it, have that, and I use it. I mean, if you if you go if you look them up. It's 350 in print. He'll he'll send it to you. Um, this is an example of people ha literally literally hacking the game. It's called hack. Yeah. But um, this is really what the my opinion what the OSR is about is finding making your campaign your game right for you. We well, I, I've been house ruling stuff that I didn't even realize since my AD and D days when I. Cut out things like uh, uh, armor adjustment for weapons, oh, weapon God, speed, yeah. oh. which I never understood and, and still mm -hmm. don't. It's not a matter of uh, understanding. No, I, I think you understood it. You just didn't like the way it ran in your games. We weapon speed was so confusing with, well, the dagger could strike three times in a round. How's that happening? Um, it didn't. So I, I just left it out. And when I played at Gen Con, the DM there also left it out because apparently nobody was using it there either. But I didn't realize at the time that I was hacking the system. Well, and I, I think that's kind of the point is I think I've never met a single person and they might be out there who runs whatever game they're running exactly for rules as written, whether it's classic D and D or, you know, second edition or cyberpunk 2020 or star Wars or whatever. You know, everybody has house rules and a house rule is really a, a, a hack. Because yeah. you're you're customizing the game to fit what you want it to be to suit the needs of your table, and you're. I, I, I hesitate to, to to make an you know a definitive statement, but I, you're supposed to do that. I mean, the rules are, are vague and loose for a reason. The, the, right. There's an implicit encouragement but, to do so. But but the book says. Shut up. Oh. I'm the DM. Shut up. Yeah. Run run as written, like raw. I. I Never have rules as written. Rules as written. I always it to me it was always run as written. Yeah. But <laughs> but uh, I could never do it. Whether it was AD and D or no, Rollmaster. I, I, I have to step in here because I don't agree with you, James, on this on the, how you've classified this. I don't consider hack and house rules the same thing. I consider them two different things. To be honest. Fair yeah. enough. I I think one can lead to the other if you're if you're not going to group them into the into the same thing. You can house rule a game eventually to where you now have something completely different though. I but guess still if you're going on the same engine. I guess if you're going that route, but I just think house rules are something completely different. Hacking, like I said, is me taking the game that I love and just turning it into something completely different. But, now, can can you guys give me an example of a time you've taken a system you loved and and knew up one side and the other and and you know not household it but has as Vince said hacked it into something that it was not initially intended to do and had it work very very well. Well, now now when you say wasn't meant to, uh, if you remember the first edition DMG had quick rules in the back on how to run your AD and D with Gamma World. Yep. And Boot Hill. Boot Hill, yeah. And um, I remember mixing Gamma World, the first game I bought with my own money, um, and AD and D, and my players died real Shh. fast when the Gamma World creatures were beating their butts. Oh my god, uh, I probably needed to hack a bit more to make that actually mesh. Uh, so I don't know if it was a success or not. They had a, they had fun, but yeah, it was uh, not. Uh, not a total success as my, my players died in the first session. I think I hacked uh, Marvel, TSR Marvel from the 80s to play Transformers. That worked. 
Yeah. That sounds cool as heck. That sounds kind of awesome. Not going to lie. I did that back in the early 2000s because there was actually a website out there that actually did all the hacking for me. So I just kind of took it, wrote it out more into more of a book format for myself. Well, here's, here's, you know, along that line, you could probably hack Marvel into anything that Marvel would put out like G.I. Joe or Conan. That's true. Or something like that. Yeah, because we're not. Face rip is it scales so ridiculously high you can do almost anything with it. Yes. Yeah. I oh, um now, now you got me going. I think I'm gonna make Conan. <laughs> I um I hacked the old D6 Star Wars. That was one of my go-to games right. back in the day. Um, uh, into an Indiana Jones game, which is funny because they later put out a D6 Indiana Jones book. Oh, Yes. I forgot about that, yeah. But the only problem with that remember? game was one person played Indiana Jones. Yeah. Well, no, the, that, the was, D, that was the, the TSR D, one. Yep, oh, was that, that the was TSR? The, yep, the D6 Indiana Jones was actually you made your own master plucky book, archaeologist. Master book. Oh, right, okay. I thought the master book was just you. someone played Indiana Jones. Ooh. No, no, there was three incarnations of Indiana Jones. There was... The TSR, which is where you played Indiana Jones, oh, there was Master and, Book, and you and trademarked then... Nazi if you were with uh, TSR. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trademark yes. Nazi, yeah. Uh, and um, and they they had a very brief print run for a D6 Indiana Jones hack that w- Weg actually put that's out. Right. And if you remember, that whole system was a hack, the D6 system of the original one, which was Ghostbusters. Yeah. Because they just started adding stuff in and adding on and making it a little that, and then the next we got D6. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, back back to basic D&D. Uh, <laughs> I think when you're hacking something like that, it's always the spirit. And first you try and get the spirit of the thing by changing a few things and then find out how that affects the, the, the overall game. Yes. Yes. I think you, you, it definitely goes back to the spirit of what you're trying to bring to the table. Yes. And it comes times where it doesn't work. Um, but if you keep to that spirit, I think you can find a way to make it work if you're willing to not overcomplicate it. Right. I mean, there's things like um, gl- games. I've seen games take alignment out of the game which minor to me is a minor effect on spells like no alignment and detect evil or good or something like that. That's see, that's fixable to me. Well, and, yeah. I, and I think removing alignment gives you a more Conan esque experience. You know, Conan is, you know, I, I, I live, I love, I slay, I am content. Conan is almost in and of himself beyond alignments. So right. characters would probably want to emulate that style of hero, if, if you can call him a hero. Right. Um, so alignments just don't really, to me, don't suit a Conan-style game. Okay, well, that, but that's just one example of hacking something, and then you have to look and see how it affects the rest of the game. I mean, you don't have to get anal about it, but wow. you do have to be aware of when you change. How, how robust is the system where you change one thing are these two other things going to be out of whack? Yep. Well, Unforeseen consequences. How yes. about, well, you know what? Then then we, we kind of have the uh, house ruling versus hacking. Like with house rules, those house rules are pretty much there. They are replacing rules in the game and they're not going to be changed. Whereas when you're hacking, you got to be flexible because you are meshing things that might be incompatible and you got to smooth things out, which means your players have to do that thing that uh, some uh, newer players might have a problem with, which is a lot of faith and trust in your game master. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, you really do, for, for as much as one of the things that drives me nuts about uh, the outsider perception of the MSR is that we're all about killing characters, and it's actually, to me, the opposite. It's about trusting your DM to create a good experience. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen DMs who have put in a house rule or a hack rule, and it doesn't work at the table. They're just going, you know what, guys? Never mind. It works like this because I say it works like this, and we'll deal with the details of it later. Well, that's yeah. how a good DM should run a game. It's always story trumps rules. We'll discuss things later. Just move on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and when hacking or house ruling, really, 
to even. I mean, it's like sometimes you don't see these things until you get it up on its feet and play. Yep. Oh, certainly. Well, it's like we were talking about before the show, Glenn, you know, systems that read like a train wreck and play like, you right. know, play like a song. Yeah. It just doesn't translate to the page. Right. You know, the experience. Right. And, and not only being a good DM and being willing to recognize that, being a good player and not like, not hounding your DM if, if they try to implement an, an optional or house rule or hack or whatever and it just doesn't work, not being like, well, the rule says this and, you know, you shouldn't have done it that way. You know, if that's how you feel, that's fine, but bring it up yeah. after the table because it just makes it, it – first of all, it, it, it insults your GM. It makes them not want to run a game for you, and it's it's rude. Yeah. You know, if I really want to get in their face, well, the book says I'm changing the book, but you can't do that. So, excuse me, I paid X amount of dollars for this book. I... Uh, I'm real quick, and it's I guess it's because I'm getting old and, and angry to say, you know, if you don't like my game, you don't have to play. I've um, heard that too. You know, yeah. and it's and I, and I, I hate saying that because it makes me sound like a jerk. But you know, I'm old. I have a full time job and a wife and kids and a you know a small publishing business run. I don't have time for my gaming to not be fun. You know, we all put way too much work in it for it to, oh man, I don't feel like playing that. I got to play with Bob. Yeah. You know, he's going to do that thing. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and you know, no, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm done with that. Yeah, exactly. And you know, hacking is darn fun. <laughs> it really is. Well, and it's, it, it's neat to see your players like you'll you'll implement something unusual or something new and unexpected and and like it's a great way to get out of that ho hum up oh, it's another goblin or up oh, it's another magic sword what, whoa there's a laser gun in here what yeah. I've never seen a laser gun in the book you know and you know then, then all of a sudden oh you know the game gets a little fresher a little more exciting not because everybody wants a laser gun but because they recognize right. that there's potential beyond the written word. Hey, can oh, we yeah. talk? We can, can we talk about a little about like mashing things, as far as hacking goes? Absolutely. Uh, I've always had a problem with ha with mashing sci-fi with fantasy, um, and I come to realize it's because the examples I've seen they don't do it the way I like it. Okay. What's an example of how you? What's an example of both sides? Both how you would okay, like. Okay, here's it, how you here's an it. example. I just finished uh, doing a. Uh, Old Man Grogna review on uh, one of the modules for Astonishing Sword, uh, a Forgotten Fane of the Coil Goddess. And they introduced snake men in there who have some kind of technology, but it's alien technology. I said, now this is the way I like to do it. It's got to look alien. It's got, they've got like a teleporter they haven't finished. They got a communicator kind of thing like a ray gun, but it shouldn't look, you know, don't, don't just drop like a Star Wars blaster in front of your fantasy game, uh, fantasy group. That kind of bothers you. That's why Barrier Peaks always bothered me because it's like, boom, thing crashes, sits there, and you got to go down there, and it just the technology just slaps you in the face. It's like somebody took Gandalf and slapped him with Star Wars. I, I've had similar issues. Um, if I've ever introduced sci-fi like laser guns in my game, I say, well, you find a bent silver rod it's got an right. odd bend in it you know and let because it should be alien and it should be it unusual should. so yeah, the person, like, what am i going to do with a bent silver rod i don't know you have to screw with it for a while yeah i mean snake men come from the stars say and they've got these these rods that look like fancy lightning bolts that shoot lasers out of them or something like that see that's why i don't have a trouble with things like thundar with, or He-Man, which has a mix of both fantasy and sci-fi in it, because they kind of blend it together where I can buy it. Okay. And uh, so I kind of like it like that, because a long time ago, I used to say, no, sci-fi, fantasy does not mix. No, no, no. But then I started thinking about it and dealing with it and actually playing it, and I'm going, okay, it's the way they do it I don't like. And if they're going to hack it, if you're going to hack it, you got to do it in the way that not only the players can buy it, but the DM can buy it too. I mean, that's my that's my personal picadillo. If I'm running, would hack it, pretty much. That's yeah. why I like that Warriors of the Red Planet, where they had the gadgets instead of spells, which were basically gadgets. Yeah, I'll throw that in my fantasy game. It'll work. 
Yeah, and I, and I think it, it comes down to what will the players and the GM ex- accept. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and just because you introduce a ray gun doesn't mean the game has suddenly turned into Flash Gordon or Star Wars. It's still classic D&D. They're just, I mean, you know, Gary has all kinds of sci- you know, sci-fi stuff in Appendix N. You know, Dying Earth, right. the magic spells are implicitly high technology and, you know, mm-hmm. f- you know quasi-physics formulas. Yeah. So it's, it's a matter of how you introduce it how you mash your genres. You don't just say, all right, guys, I know we're playing D&D, but here's a lightsaber. You, you don't do that. Yeah. You know, does anyone remember the old Wand of Force? I think it was in second edition. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was a lightsaber. Let's let's call it what it was. It was a lightsaber. Psychic- or if you got to get really 70s tacky, Thunder Sun Sword. What about... You're yes. telling me that's not technology? Psychic Energy Blade was always a hell of a... <sighs> That was always a hack for people using the uh, lightsaber, too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was your big sigh for, James? <laughs> yeah, I'm calling you out. I've had experiences with people with the psychic energy blade. Please do and then tell. they want to multi-class into Cyan Assist, and then they want to play a friggin' Jedi, and it's not Star Wars, and I love Star Wars. It's not Star Wars. We're playing Jack Wagon. We're playing D and D. But 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 I want. That Go was to always, Tashi Station, you whiny farm boy. That's what I always ah. dis, dis, disliked about anything with D and D with psionics. And it was always like you're no. It's like playing a Jedi. And this is not Star Wars. Yeah. This is D and D. That's sorry. The way, that's the way I feel. No, I, I will say Dark Sun is the only setting I've seen that did psionics well because it integrated it naturally to the set. It did. Yeah, that. What? But that's exactly what Glenn was saying. It. You know, if you're gonna mesh it make it true to the setting or make the setting fit that mesh. If you just slap it together, yeah, it, it feels artificial. What you better do is base, pick your base setting. And if you already got a campaign, that's your base to that. Hmm. Right. If the you're, other way around. If you're running Dark Sun, it's fine to have Sonics. Uh-huh. If, you, if you're running Greyhawk, they should be almost absent or be you know one person shows up with one wild talent in the entire campaign if at all you know it, it's not don't include something that's a hack or something unusual just for the sake of including it make sure it contributes right. to either the feel you're trying to create or the story you're trying to tell or it integrates into the world you're doing yep or i mean or introducing you're probably a, a great example to me is a way that people have already been using psionics is Mind flares. Sure, yes. they're magic spells, but they're really psychic abilities. And they're there, and they're outside the purview of players, but they can still experience it and recognize that there's a, a world out there undreamt of to them and unavailable to them. There are things in the world that are truly alien. Right. Well, right there, we're talking about hacks. The psionic system for 1E didn't even fit the system it was being no. hacked into. And I you know, now when you go ahead at Dark Sun, the psionic system is built to fit the game system, mm-hmm. not just the setting. Psionics in 1E never felt right. It always felt like it was a... It, a real, tack on. Oh, oh, tack on. As, as were the grappling and unarmed combat rules. But that's right. Well, right. yeah. And the secondary careers. Uh, that's I'm a problem. Fletcher. I'm a Fletcher. That's that's my bugaboo, but that's for another day. That's for another episode. And, and there are good products out there that do add sound. Like, uh, um, oh my, Richard LeBlanc. Yes, um, yes. He did a great BX Sonics book. It's awesome, but he ties it to a culture, right? And that way, you can include that culture in your setting or not. Um, so it gives you a way to ground it in your game. Um, so if you want to have that present, you can have it present. And if not, well, then you just don't use it. You know, just because you have the option to hack or include or add something doesn't it doesn't create an obligation. How many of you guys have ever run a game where your your player came in with the the, the new thing, the new book, and was like, oh, I want to use this, yeah. and like you're just it. like, and then you feel obligated because it's there. I run a two E <laughs> podcast. Remember, yeah, I run into that. <laughs> oh man, oh yeah, splat book, splat book, splat book, yeah. I got the complete book of human alert. I want to play a... Bloat alert. Bloat alert. Bloat alert. Yeah. 
I I was in a two E game. I mean, this is a bit off off topic, but it's just too funny. Guy walked up, pulled out the complete book of ninjas, and said, "I want to play a nin." And before he had the word ninja out of his mouth, the DM had picked the book up and hit him with it and said, "No." <laughs> That's a good way to solve that issue, now, isn't it? A then ninja. Should, it was hilarious. Should have taken, but yeah, I mean, thrown it out the window and then played a different edition completely. Kill it know, with fire. And and ways to introduce your your new options or the things you want to play with. You know, there's always more to add to the edge of the map. Maybe they come across a new kingdom ruled by psychic serpent men, and this is the first time anyone's encountered psychic abilities, to keep using this example. And so the players don't have access to it, but they're introduced to yeah. it. And maybe these so the psychic serpent men have, a, have human slaves, and if your player dies, they might have the option of coming back as a human slave who's a sonic. You know, there are ways to integrate it into the game. You don't don't just drop it at the table from the get-go, unless everyone's you know okay how, with that. You know, how I, did, knows. you know how I did that with campaigns, which was <laughs> <laughs> castles and crusades. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of D&D. &D. Um, what I did was I had all these different races from the supplement bluff side, because we were playing in bluff side. And I didn't, I introduced them gradually as NPCs to see with the players. Yep. And, there I is. Them, and I picked them very carefully to make sure they wouldn't overpower stuff. Um, there was a Dragori, which is basically a lizard man dragon cross. I introduced him as a monk to rival the dwarven monk that was in the party. And next thing I know, they're wanting to play one. And cool. so I'm open to that. That's a hack right there. I'm open to that because I introduced it. They liked it. I feel comfortable with it. We can go with it. Not, I have the next splat book, let's do it. Yeah, and, and just because it's it's there and it's available doesn't mean your players sh should necessarily have that option. There's, there's you know, the old NPC classes. You know, granted, everyone wanted to play them as a PC, but, you know, every single book I've seen, every incarnation of, of D and D, classic D&D that had race and class, it said right. this race can be these classes, though NPCs may act outside that. Right. So if you want to have a halfling magic user as an NPC in your campaign, sure. But unless DM says otherwise, your player is, you know, a fighter or a thief or, you know, whatever, you know, you, know, you just can't be a magic user. They're too rare, you know. I, the should, fact that I, I always, my philosophy is you don't introduce an NPC class. If you can't play, if they can't play it, then don't introduce it. I am, um, I'm a little more draconian on it because in my attitude is you're already an adventurer. You're already exceptional by the fact that you have a class mm -hmm. trying to one up on top of it is just you're guilty in the lily at that point. And just except right. the fact that you're a thief in the first place, not a zero level commoner. Right. Okay. And I also, I also talked to, I think it was you, Tim Kask or Frank Mitzer at the con. And, Why are these NPC classes from Dragon? You know, I don't want to use, he says, Basically, they were classes we didn't play tests. We made them an NPC class. That sounds about right. We couldn't, we didn't play test them, so we'll just throw them out there for people to use as NPCs. Let's yeah. find out. Let's get feedback from the fans. That sounds about yeah. right for TSR. Magazines, yeah, magazines have deadlines. Yeah, well, yeah, you're beta testing D and D for us. And you're welcome. Tim cast uh, ran the magazine for a while. I'm mean, gonna guess you were talking with Tim. It sounds sounds about right, though. It could have been Roger Moore. Yeah. Well, yeah, but Roger Moore came in later around, what, like, issue 60 or so? Yeah. And and that's been done in D&D up until late 3rd edition. They did a book in late 3rd called Book of Nine Swords, which was clearly playtest for 4th edition. Right. There was you know. a splat book for two that called Sages and Spats that I didn't want to buy because they were all in. Right. It's like, I can't use this. They're all NPCs. Well, and you can even take some of those later NPC stuff and, you know, pare it down, whittle it down, and stick it in your in your basic, you know, game or your it's classic good. game. Um, I, I did that specifically with Sages and Specialists because they're so such simple classes. It's not you know? that hard to reverse engineer or forward engineer, I should say, either one. Mm -hmm. Reverse right, forward right. any edition. I mean, I, I don't understand how people get caught up in like, oh my god, it's a, oh, it's fifth edition. I can't use that in my classic team. Sure you can. Find the equivalent that's close to it. W compare the two. Hack things down to what you think it should be. It's your game. What does it matter? You're not publishing it for profit or for the world to see. You're doing it for your game. What does it matter? Maybe finds Right. Stealing stealing from games is good. Yeah. As long uh, as your I've, game is fun, who cares? 
5e right. came out within a week i said i didn't want i didn't want to run it but i sure found something to steal out of it <laughs> well and, oh. and here's here's just a quick thing on that one if you are going to do that and i fully encourage it uh i i would suggest that whatever you're converting uh make it a little bit weaker than your uh your we all want to be a power gamer on some level without even realizing it. Make it right. weaker than it should be because you can always uh, flesh it up, but you can never take powers away from uh, your players without Let's... having dice thrown at you. It's and easier to give them something that. more than to take something away. Yes. Let me let me suggest a book that if you're going to introduce stuff like new classes and how to like scale them down and up, uh, creature crucible top ballista yes because it's got all sorts of monsters and demi humans you can play and they show you how to do it and they show you how to scale down something that's you know yeah like a tanari or something you know <laughs> what is winged monkeys called yeah. i forget the yeah, xp charts those were brutal <laughs> too yeah so they show you okay they i know they're powerful but start this way and they just walk you through it it's great and okay. i really like that because they got gnomes in it yes uh, gotta have gnomes in a game no you don't yes i do you do right. i don't enough about right. gnomes. Gnomes. gnomes 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 we're Is gonna get bad? nowhere with that conversation well, oh, that's bad right. gnomes bad, bad gnome. gnome but anyway i've told you anything i can think of about hacking well here i'm gonna throw one thing out there um, go ahead thank you glenn for your permission <laughs> yeah i'm gonna thank you i, I, I appreciate it glenn I'll, I'll try to talk over you while i do this yeah well you can kiss my hand like glenn is playing the role of john mclaughlin in this podcast <laughs> <laughs> you're wrong you're wrong you are wrong pap cannon i know you know you think you know but you don't know um, go, go ahead eric go ahead since we're talking about hacks, uh, Adventure Conqueror King system is a hack of Labyrinth Lord, which is basically a hack of, of BX. BX, yeah. But uh, it has a companion book, and the companion book has alternate classes, and it also has formulas for you to design your own classes. So if you want to have, if, if you we've been talking about uh, optional classes or you know hacking classes, here's a book that's uh, you know part of the osr it's out there you can you can literally look at it and if you're, if you're we're talking bx we're talking classic dnd you can look at it and and you should be able to you know literally hack together a class by looking at these balances you got there i believe it's the uh axe companion book axe companion yes, book yes yeah All right, i just want yeah, to get it's, a it's for that. yeah I want to get a link for that for our show notes for people so they can go grab I've been, I've that. I've been arguing with Eric Fabiashi about that because I don't like domain name play, and he does. <laughs> I think I think it, it takes a certain kind of person to do domain play. Yeah. <laughs> but there's an example of, you want to talk about hacking, there were almost no rules for that. For, you better come up with something. For high, you like, high, doing... like high level play, you mean? Well, domain play. If you're ruling domain and your nations start going to war, there aren't a whole lot of rules. That's true. You better come up with something. I, I hacked together rules for uh, my group to take over the Wild Coast in Greyhawk, and really? that's before Battle System came out. Wow. Uh, yep. yep. I put together combat charts for armies, and I wish I still had that stuff. It was crap. But when you're 18, 19, it was good. Of course, I ruined, I, I ruined my, my original Greyhawk box set. Well, folio <laughs> map. Folio map wasn't even the box set. It was the folio. So I took a grease pencil to, to mark out the, oh. as, my, as my players were conquering land. And you then I realized... Dirty, you couldn't, dirty son of a... You, you hey. couldn't really erase it. All it did was smear. Oh. So, so it kind of oh. had a decent effect that you're like, well, wherever my players were, they were burning it, everything down anyway. Yeah. So I guess it's a good effect. <sighs> Uh, grease pen. Uh, Eric yes. is as as a grognard. I died a little inside. <laughs> Hearing about that. Yeah, I, I just I'm. Oh. Well, then I shouldn't tell you when I picked up an, uh, my copy of Empire of the Petal Throne box set that was on eBay that was still in the shrink for ninety five bucks. And the first thing I did when I got it home, well, out of the mail, was to uh, rip off the shrink. 
See, that I understand, because if you're going to okay, use it fine. and play it, I get it. Yeah. My, um, my collection is a... I would say my collection... Which means no, well, it means no shrink wrap. I'm going to be using that I'm playing, and, you know, I'm I'm not a collector. I'm not going to keep it pristine in the shrink. Anyway. I though, though I've heard legends at NTRPG that someone bought a uh, an original white box D&D and then said just to watch all the people scream, they opened it right there. I'll still, I, I believe it. Well, I wasn't there for wow. it, but I, I believe it. You know what? If I had the money, I would do that. But for I, the prices they get at that those auctions, yeah. Oh my God. Well, I saw one that sold not not at NTRPG, but on eBay recently. What was it, Eric? Twenty one thousand dollars. Oh yeah, that was from yeah. the uh, first print wood grain. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, amazing. Yes, that's right. Um, but yeah, I mean, okay. Here, here's here's a question. What kind of hacks have you done in the past? Uh, rules, monsters, NPCs, you, you know, whatever. The systems that didn't work. What have you done in the past? Uh, White Star. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean that you haven't published. <laughs> oh, um, I mean, like like house rule. Um, I think the greatest, the most common example that people don't even think of is crit charts. Everybody comes up with a house crit chart at some point or a crit roll. You know, that's, that's a true. classic hack, you know. That's, you know, and some of them are, are look, hit bloody, location charts. Hit location yeah. charts, you know, you know, and, and those are great. Um, I always come up with some kind of on the fly nautical rules because I've yet to find a set of nautical rules that could play smoothly. Right. So uh, your oh, yeah. hack is in, uh, you won't ask if we did a system for a different game or just house rules? Which Wait. one are you defining it as, Glenn? I mean, you know, it, changing something, adding a monster, subtracting a system. Because, you know, whatever you do to make the game your own. Back in the day, I, I converted AD&D back into Evil Dead to play modern day game. But I did a D20 modern before it was D20 modern. So. Oh, okay. Well, that works. Because everyone wanted to be Bruce Campbell or Ash Williams back then. So. Oh, hell yes. I, um, I took The Lost City. And I remember going through it with a pencil mm -hmm. and restatting it for D6 Star Wars as an abandoned space colony. Wow. Oh, that's cool. Hmm. No, I know Fulon has in the planet Ravenloft. Okay. That's kind of, it blows my mind, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. I, I, I've actually... I've used some of the third edition Ravenloft stuff to run in in basic style D and D, and it's it's not that hard, you know. A really? lot of times, uh, oh, not at all, not at all, um, because most of it's all like your your fear of corruption horror tests are all saving throws, um, because everything right. still still runs on the same almost the same AC progression and the same attribute progression. It's very little to change. Um, the hardest part was in the second edition, Domains of Dread, was taking those classes into basic. And even that wasn't tough. You're right. You're right. Well, I just thought I'd throw it out and see what you get. Yeah, well, you know, listen, one thing I've, I've done a lot is I've taken uh, Dungeon Crawl Classic Adventures for the uh, new RPG, and I run them with Swords and Wizardry. I, I literally just hack it in-game. I, I'll, you know, I know the adventure. I, I convert it to Swords of Wizardry on the fly because I like the adventures, but I'm more comfortable with Swords of Wizardry. Okay. All right. I, I think in, in the end, what it, what it boils down to is is what you're doing fun, fair to your players, and, you know, are you having a good time? And, and if you are, it, it doesn't matter yeah. how you're hacking, what you're hacking, whether what your house ruling. If you're having a good time, you're doing it right. Um, and don't be afraid to do it, and don't be afraid to make mistakes and correct yourself in the process. If it works, it works. Yep. No, that's it, that's the bottom and line. It, and if it doesn't, kill it. <laughs> With fire. Oh, God, always fire. With kindness, Glenn. It's kindness. <laughs> no, no, no. My play is it's always Me? fire. kindness? Yes, you, <laughs> sir. See, what Vince doesn't tell you is his battle axe is named kindness. Oh, oh. oh there you go. <laughs> There you go. <sighs> no, it's my psychic energy blade. Uh, and on that <laughs> oh, note, boo, folks, I think um, I think we'll close. We'll 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 close out 
on the on the the psychic energy sadness. Cause, well, we can try. We can try anyway. Let's play that sad music in the background of us leaving, walking down. Oh, never mind. Linus and his. No, no. I think we're gonna add <laughs> uh, some uh, some good music from the '80s. Let's go. Let's go. Meet um, Guns and Roses, like sadness. Can we put some like you know <laughs> like uh, '70s funky disco? Like I Rick James. Yeah, there we go. How about I used to, I used to love her, but I had it killer. Yeah, and she's lying people. six feet under. Yeah, no, not, 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 not appropriate. Okay, sorry. I, I got um, "Don't Cry" instrumental from playing in the background. So, oh, that or that that solo from November Rain. Hmm. Don't, don't cry. <clears throat> but uh, give us your feedback. Head over onto facebookcom slash or die podcast. Hit us up on Twitter, uh, Save or Die Staff. Give us your feedback on what you think of these episodes. Uh, that's how we work. Go over to iTunes. Punch in well, Save or Die thank, Podcast. Thanks, they're gonna. Thanks. Now they're going to tell us. Yeah. Go over to uh, get punch <laughs> iTunes, pop up iTunes, punch in Save or Die podcast and give us a review. Let people know how the new shows are going. I, we're not asking you to compare to the old shows. Just say what the new show is doing. Don't mention the old regime because that's not fair. Yeah. You, but not if fair you want to compare, compare it to Thaco's Hammer, that's okay. So it'd be five versus one, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah you can also you can also hit up the uh the google plus community um oh yeah you know, and don't be don't be afraid to talk to us you know what what would you like to see what do you what do you want to see in the future for uh save it expert edition yeah you know you know we, we we really want to draw in the community and keep you guys involved you know classic dnd is alive because of you because mm-hmm. people are still playing it so let's keep playing it let's keep playing it together and let's keep talking about it and yeah this- you want to hit us up, like like James said, you can go uh, to. I'm tab man. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can <laughs> head over to. Fa- um, you're on YouTube, Glenn. Old Man Grognard. Do you have an actual URL yeah. for that, or is it just find old? Uh, man? It's just you t- type in Old Man Grognard. I've got a channel. It's Glenn Holster. I think it's Glenn Holstrom. You know, you should uh, you should buy a dot yeah. com for Old Man Grognard and just redirect it to your YouTube channel. Yeah, if I can figure out how those work. I will help you, Glenn. Oh, thank you, sir. May I have another? I mean, uh, thank you, sir. And could you let us know how to get to Eric's blog? <laughs> oh, Tanker's boy. Tavern at blogspot.com. <laughs> yeah, uh, Tanker's Tavern.com. Head over to the evil DM.com for me. James, your halflings luck. Dot blogspot.com? Um, or, or just halflings luck.com will redirect. Ah, perfect. Um, I'm also at whitestarrpg.com, uh, Barrel Rider Games on RPG Now. Uh, you know, I'm I'm around. And you'll find you'll find Vincent me on uh, Texas uh, <laughs> old school. Old school. <laughs> How do we get hold of you? Glenn, Glenn can never remember any website links. If you'd like to find myself, Glenn, and Eric Tanker on another show, you can hit us up on Old School Blues Podcast. That's DGSTexas.com. That's yeah. more focusing on uh, new up and coming products in the OSR. This uh, is true. Small publishers, indie publishers, their their work, and we've been reviewing a lot of those. I think some good feedback for that. Episode number eight as of right now. And I hear I do another show, I don't remember what it is. And so. <laughs> Enough of that. And on those notes, we're going to say goodnight, everybody. Oh. Yeah, good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.